uh, both virtually and at home to Center for Brain Health. And our Brain Health Presents tonight is going to be Everyday Curiosity, Practices That Improve Creativity. So by a show of hands, who's here for the first time tonight? Awesome. Awesome. Well, welcome to Center for Brain Health. And we are part of the University of Texas at Dallas. And not only do we co do core academic research on how to keep measure and keep the brain healthy and improving over, over the lifespan, we translate that into tools, services, and programs that actually help you improve how you think, work, and live. And we're going to find out today, curiosity is a big part of that. So we're really looking forward to it. A couple of housekeeping items. For the virtual audience, please know that you'll be able to ask questions at the end. So do that in the Q&A. Uh, and we'll get to a few of those at the end. We'll save time at the end. And for the audience here, there will be time for some questions from the audience. Uh, let me make sure I get my, oh, a couple of other thank yous. So first of all, thank you to KERA. Obviously, they're our great public TV partner here in, uh, in Texas. And then I also want to thank Marlene. I think she got delayed uh, with the weather. But Marlene Miller, who is a longtime supporter of Center for Brain Health and on our advisory board, uh, sponsored tonight's uh, event. So thank you. So I'm going to briefly introduce Jen Zients, who is uh, going to be working with uh, Professor uh, Nazir tonight. But Jen uh, kind of does it all here. She's been here for over 20 years. She started when she was two. And uh, so she's touched really every aspect of our training and our research. So she knows it all. She's trained anything from executives to Navy SEALs to everything in between. And then I'm really pleased to introduce, and she's going to dive in deeper with Professor Nazir, but Professor Cassini Nazir is here from the University of North, North Texas. I'm going to leave further introductions to Jen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, everybody. I'm super excited to have you guys. Really excited to have Cassini. Um, just FYI for context, we had a call, a prep call that I think was scheduled for 45 minutes. And I think we talked for an hour and 15 minutes or something. So this is gonna be a really fascinating evening. I hope everyone starts churning their questions and that you're prepared to engage and ask. So um, Dr. Cassini Nazir, as Steve already said, for those of you who are here, you have his bio in front of you, but for the virtual audience, I just wanna sort of reinforce some, reinforce some of the cool things about Cassini. So number one, he's an assistant professor in the College of Visual Arts and Design at the University of North Texas. And before he went to UNT, he was one of our very own. He was at the University of Texas at Dallas, and he really oversaw two big labs that, was, that were really transdisciplinary. So I'm gonna talk about that in a second. He also, though, in the spring of 2020, was a designer in residence um, in the Masters in Design and Innovation program at SMU. So he's really, put a lot of seeds around in the Dallas academia world. And the amount of, I think, students, the number of students that he's touched and reached and inspired is quite impressive. Our own team, we have students who went into ATEC, which is the Arts, Technology, and Emerging Communications. It's now, it's kind of evolved. But the ATEC school at UT Dallas, several of those students have, are part of our team now. And many of them really, could not wait to be in his class. And then guess what? He went to UNT. So <laughs> it was really kind of an unfortunate, but hopefully they'll get some education tonight from him, directly from him. Um, design is something I think that is really interesting. Curiosity, both. Both of these things really transcend any one thing that we do. And so I think it's really interesting to be thinking about the transdisciplinary work that you've done, the teams that you've worked with, when he was at UTD, he was the founding director of the ATEC Usability Lab, which fostered collaborative research with the community. And it brought a lot of experiential learning to students. That's, not, that's kind of unique in that world. But also he was the director of design for the Art Sci Lab, which was a transdisciplinary research lab that meshed arts, science, technology, and really tried to address important issues in the community and society at large. So one last thing I want to say about Cassini before I bring you up, it, or before I ask you to come up. Um, think about this. Curiosity is linguistically rooted in the notion of care. And so he's going to be talking about this, but designers extend the care 
of what they design to who they're designing on behalf of and for and what they're designing. And so I just want to give you that kind of thing to think about. And as you're listening to Cassini tonight, think about that and how what he's talking about really does apply to your life in this idea of curiosity and the notion of care. So without further ado, Cassini Nazir. Thank you, Jennifer. I know what you're thinking. If, Jennifer, if my conversation with Jennifer was 45 minutes and we went over by to an hour and 15, what's tonight <laughs> going to be like? We will end on time. <laughs> Let me say that first. Uh, first, thank you for joining us this evening. Today's a good day for curiosity. Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I hope when you leave that you'll discover ways to make curiosity every day in your life, or whatever day it needs to be in your life. And I'm hoping that as you walk away, you'll walk away with some practical and tactical ways to introduce or maybe reintroduce curiosity into your life. My name, as you've heard, is Cassini Nazir. I always tell people Cassini, like the space probe that was sent in, into space and crashed into Saturn in 2017. It was nice knowing you. <laughs> or the fashion designer, Oleg Cassini, his last name, my first name. Um, I teach interaction design at the University of North Texas, but maybe the most important thing that you should know about me is that probably like you, I always looked at the world from a slightly different <laughs> angle. That's me at the ripe old age of one uh, in my homeland of Trinidad, taking a close look at the world from the ground up. Now, today's session is gonna be interactive, so why don't we all uh, get on the floor and take a look? <laughs> Absolutely not. It will be interactive, uh, we'll keep that for later. But that's my mom up there at the top right of the photo, and I have my mom to thank for my curiosity. She's one important person in my life. Um, I also have my father to thank. After all, we basically had the same haircut. Uh, here's my father telling me a joke, and here's my father making a meal. When I think back on my curiosity, as I think maybe it's true for you, it all starts in my childhood. In fact, when I talk to individuals about curiosity, that's often where it begins because it's almost as though we want to go back to our childhood and retrieve some things and bring it back with us. Maybe we can do that today. A moment ago, I told you I'm a designer um, and I'm an interaction designer. That's often a question of, well, what exactly does that mean? The phones that you hold in your hands, the interfaces on the vehicles that you've probably driven to get here, interaction designers design those things. We design the interfaces and the services that you interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. But a lot of people think that designers are in the business of creating interfaces. And while that's true, it's not completely sort of encompassing. I think we're actually in the business of designing memories. To illustrate this point, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a regular eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Now, this sheet of paper is gonna represent all that we can experience in the world around us. If you want to, to do this at home or here, I'm gonna write the word reality up at the top. This represents everything that there is out there in the world that we can experience. Now, I'm gonna fold the page in half because of all the things that we can experience in the world outside of us, not everything we can perceive. So there's a cut that we make in our perception. We can't perceive everything that's out there. And that's a function of the human senses that we have within our body. I'm gonna make a fold again. Because of all the things that we can perceive, not everything we're gonna pay attention to. I'm gonna stop talking here for a moment, dangerous thing. And I want you to notice what was always audible, but you weren't paying attention to moments ago. Maybe your stomach is grumbling a little bit. Maybe you're hearing some, some noise. But all of that sound was there moments ago. We just weren't paying attention to it. Now, if all of the things that are out there that we can experience, that we can perceive, that we pay attention to, not everything makes it into our memory. And this is an important concept, that there's so many things out there that we might be able to pay attention to that we don't recall, we don't remember just gave away the next fold, shame on me. The last fold is all of the things that we can remember, not everything we, we can recall. 
And this is a folding activity that's very simple, that sort of, it explains how we absorb experiences. But this is actually where I begin designing. I ask my students the question, long after the experience is passed, what's the memory that I want to remain? And then we try to design from there. What's the memory that we want to leave behind? I want to say that maybe here today, we're all going to be grappling with that question. What's the memory that we want to leave behind? Now, you might be scratching your heads and saying, wait a second. I thought this talk was about curiosity. Why is he talking about memory? Well, as it turns out, if you can invite people to be curious, it's a powerful way to make things more memorable. My work focuses on giving individuals a first orientation to what I describe as a very strange, fascinating, and fragile phenomenon of being curious. Being curious is something that we all experience, but sometimes it's hard to stay curious. Sometimes it's hard to sustain that curiosity. So my work explores how can we invite others to do that and build them into the things that we design. I want to share with you, just for a moment, some of the history of curiosity. We're not going to go through all of these names. If this were a graduate class, we would spend time on each of these individuals here who's shaped my understanding of curiosity. But really what I would like you to see is that curiosity is an experience that has made its way through multiple disciplines, from philosophy and science that's given us the tone and tenor of curiosity. Is it a positive thing? Is it a negative thing? Is it a virtue? From psychology that's told us how does curiosity manifest in us as human beings as well as in animals? Education shows us how curiosity might edify. And then the field that I'm in, arts and design, shows how might we use curiosity as a way to engage in experiences. Now, you know very well if I were to ask you what is curiosity, you would be able to come up with pretty accurate definitions of it. We know it intuitively. Hans George Voss says that curiosity is the motivation to explore. It's pretty straightforward. And it arises when there's this gap between what we know and what we want to know. When those triangles are pushed apart, you, there's curiosity that arises out of that. And it's our goal to sort of push those two back together. Now, an important point here is that when we explore and we learn and we gain new knowledge or experiences, we don't know all that there is to know from that experience. And it's an important thing to keep asking the question, what else? That's a really powerful question with curiosity. Now, I'm speaking to you about curiosity as if it's sort of above the neck. What I'd like to do is to have you bodily feel curiosity. So we're gonna do something silly here. Don't worry, you won't be the only one. I'll be doing it, I'm on camera. Um, and we're going to do a simple activity. You don't have to get up, but I would like you to put your right hand up and put your, point your index finger, that's the first finger, be careful, to the sky. And what I want you to do is point it up as sort of high as you can get it and trace the, the direction of a clock in the sky. We're gonna go 12, Three, six, nine, 12, three, six, nine. And you should see your hand moving in the correct direction. 12, three, six, nine, excellent. No broken clocks here, that's, that's fantastic. Now, as you're doing that, continue rotating in the direction that a clock would go. What I want you to do is to slowly just bring it down. Yeah, there we go, very good. I feel like a Peloton instructor uh, up here. Now, take a look at the direction your finger is moving. Mm. Which direction is it going? <laughs> Counterclockwise. The opposite. Now, if you didn't get it, let me, let me explain. What I asked you to do was to point in the sky and carve out the direction a clock goes. And you kept doing that. You did it correctly. But your point of view changed as the thing itself stayed constant. And the thing that at one point was going clockwise now became counterclockwise. Curiosity is powerful. It explains why one individual can look at something from one vantage point and see one area, and we can look at it and see something else. We can be curious about those experiences. 
Now, I do work with businesses who seek to harness curiosity and creativity. And I'm sure if you've seen these four words, inform, attract, attract, engage, and delight, you've probably seen them in the form of a funnel, with each separate word being smaller and smaller. And this is a funnel metaphor that basically I think is wrong. Because any viscous liquid that you pour into a funnel, if you leave it there long enough, it's just going to flow down. And I don't think that that's true. I don't think that if you inform an individual and wait long enough, they're going to be engaged. They may never be attracted to the services or products that, that you, you offer. So I think Swiss cheese is a better metaphor for this. And you wouldn't be wrong if you thought this slide was a little cheesy. <laughs> but Businesses will create efforts, this red line, in order to inform audiences. And here, they're meeting an impasse. They're not able to attract. So they would do what you would probably do in that scenario. They would take a different approach. And here, they're able to inform and attract, but they're not able to engage. Now, curiosity creates an openness to change. And if you meet an impasse, and you're able to get people curious, curiosity has this magical ability to almost open that up and create this possibility to be engaged. And if you're able to do that, you can also delight. And my work shows that if you engage earlier, you can actually shorten the distance between informing and engaging and delighting. Now let's talk a little bit about curiosity as a phenomenon. Dan Berline in the 50s discovered that curiosity is both a motivation and a behavior. Our motivation for curiosity can be perceptual, instinctual, um, and exploratory, or it can be epistemic. A moment ago, I told you about that curiosity that's above the neck. That's sort of the epistemic curiosity. It's also a behavior. Curiosity as a behavior can be specific, where we're persevering to find an answer, or it can be diversive, where we're simply trying to uh, avoid boredom or seek stimulation. Now, if you put these two by two together, there's a very familiar two by two framework. Um, and let me give you a couple of examples. We're going to start up at the top left where the monkey is trying to solve a problem. And curiosity is not a phenomenon that exists just in humans. If you've had a pet, I'm sure you've seen your pet curious about things and maybe had to you know, do something ab about that uh, as well. But here, a monkey is trying to solve a problem. If you go on YouTube, you can find videos of monkeys holding a Coke can, and they will find a way to pop open that can, which raises an interesting question. Do monkeys prefer Coke <laughs> or Pepsi? I don't know. But this is a, a perceptual and specific type of curiosity. If you go down, you'll see a rat exploring a maze. And it's not necessarily looking for anything. It's just trying to, it doesn't know whether there's anything at the end of the maze. It's just looking for something to do. And this is one way that our curiosity manifests. If we go to the right, we see a bored teenager flipping channels. I'm borrowing these examples from George Lowenstein, who's a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon University. If we were to update this, he wrote this in the 90s. If we were up to update this today, it would be this action where we're interacting with our phones and trying to be on a social media platform looking at what's going on. We're looking for desire for stimulation and we're looking for knowledge as well. If we move to the top right, this is often how we think about curiosity, epistemic and specific, where we're looking specifically to solve an answer. Now, as children, our curiosity tends to be at the bottom. And it's sort of all over the place. It's how we learn things as we grow. We get into trouble, we explore, our parents tell us, and our curiosity changes as we age to be at the top right. That specific sort of curiosity is the type of curiosity, may update that. That's the type of curiosity that, that has helped you to be in the jobs that you're in. Now, what I've tried to do is to, as a designer, to create activities for each one of these areas. We're going to explore one here in a moment, and this is going to be an opportunity for a little audience participation. Now, one of the activities that I've created is not necessarily my own activity, 
but it's something that I've borrowed that maybe you've seen before. I'm gonna play a short video. Let's, it's from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead, which is uh, a Tom Stoppard play off of uh, the, the play Hamlet. And I want you to see if you can identify what are the rules of question tennis. It's not very long. Of a game called question tennis. So that little bit of silliness right there is an activity that we're going to try to engage in. But let me first situate it in research. This activity is looking at epistemic and specific curiosity. It's one thing to ask questions about anything. If somebody were to ask you a question and you were to respond to that question with a question about anything, that's, that's easy to do it's much more challenging to stay on topic about a specific question. When my students engage in research, when we engage in research as academics, it's very important to ask additional questions that explore that topic. So with your permission, I'm gonna give you an example. And Jennifer, uh, I think you're actually mic'd up. Yeah. So um, we have some questions here, and we're going to try to play this game. Just as an example, I didn't tell you this before. No, you didn't. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I thought somebody else was gonna get lucky. That's, that's the surprise. So you're gonna pick one of those questions behind me, and then you're gonna ask me that question. What I'm going to do is I'm gonna try to respond to that question with a question. And then when I do that, you're gonna lob another question back at me, whenever you're ready. Were you in a band? What kind of band? Don't you know all the kinds of music? What kind of music? Something that made that brought joy. What kind of joy? <laughs> that with doesn't music? seem like a question. <laughs> it's okay. Keep going. Um, okay. What was your question? Sorry. Oh, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm gonna I'm gonna give that to her. I'm gonna yield here because I, I just want to ask: Was that challenging to respond to a question with a question? Yes. It's challenging. We're often taught to respond to questions with an answer. We're not taught to respond to a question, well, right, we, we're, we're definitely not taught to respond to a question with a question. But what this game can do is it can help us to build that question asking muscle that is, is sometimes challenging. We are often taught to respond with an answer. A good question is worth the effort. And question tennis is one way that we can engage in that. I'll say this, it's also a pretty fun party game if you want to, to give it a try. Um, so that's one type of activity. Going around this uh, sort of circle here, in workshops and activities, I'll give my students stimuli, and you're seeing some stimuli here, and 
this stimuli is basically an image that asks us to explore, can we come up with 40 questions for any of the images here? Now, some of them are a little bit more interesting uh, than, than others, maybe a little bit more provocative than others, but in this activity, the goal is to say, stay in the epistemic space of question asking, but this is also helping us to explore maybe in a more broad way. Rather than bouncing back and forth, we're, we're ideating around questions. Um, so that's one activity. Now the, the next thing I'm gonna show, I'm gonna show you a very small clip. Now this is also taken from improv, but I want to contextualize this as an activity that we engage in every single day. And this is perceptual and diversive curiosity. This is a game that's often played in improv called gibberish. The important part about pizza is making sure you get the dough just right. Karen Lovett starred Hannah. So I'm gonna move forward with the video. What I want you to notice is the game gibberish invites somebody, and don't worry, Jennifer. Okay. <laughs> the game of gibberish invites somebody to speak in gibberish and use hand motions as well. The individual who's translating has to pay attention to the cadence, the hand motions, maybe a hidden meaning that's in there. And you might say, how does that have anything to do with curiosity? We're doing this all the time. Jennifer mentioned that I co-directed a lab called Art Sci Lab. My partner in crime was a NASA-trained astrophysicist. When I used the word prototype, I usually meant something very quick, fast, cheap. When Roger meant the word prototype, it's not fast. It's usually physical. It's not cheap, uh, et cetera. And we are often negotiating in a form of gibberish. We're translating meaning. Now, what this helps us to do as an activity is to help think outside of ourselves and explore how are we interpreting meanings around us and what might be other meanings that are possible. Uh, the last thing that I want to show you here is a creation by this man. His name's Paul Rand. And Paul Rand designed logos. Uh, my students will generally study folks like Paul Rand. He designed the ABC logo, the Westinghouse logo, the Ford logo at one point in time. But he got in trouble for designing this logo. Now, if you've seen the IBM logo, you know that he's done something maybe a little naughty to it. In fact, this logo was temporarily banned by IBM when he posted it up because he was worried that designers would take this logo and make their own. Branding uh, is an important thing. This poster now sits in the Modern Museum of Art because what Rand has done is he's taken the image, or excuse me, the text, and created images here. Now, this is called a rebus. And a simple activity that I'll do in workshops is have people create a rebus of their name. I almost always have somebody by this name. What do we have here? We've got an image of a? Tony. We've got a toe, and we've got knee. a knee. Do we have a Tony here tonight? No, Tony, maybe there's one in the, in the virtual audience. But that's quite, quite common. Let's try another one. We've got a? Baby. A baby, what's the baby doing? Crying. Yawning in, in this case. So we've got yawn, and we've also got Yawning. a knee. Yawning. And you've got it. That's yawny. <laughs> <laughs> now, these activities are really meant to be fun and engage curiosity because that's an important part of what curiosity can do. And it's meant really for any age. What I'd like to do uh, is to just spend a little bit of time talking to you about a framework that we as designers use to invite curiosity to come forward. And coaxing curiosity to come forward can be extremely challenging because when it does arrive, it can either leave us sort of scratching our heads muttering, huh, to ourselves, or if we do it right, can leave us scratching our chins, reflectively murmuring, hmm, to ourselves. And my work explores whether it's possible to build experiences where we avoid the huh and we get to the hmm. Very scholarly words that I'm using here. <laughs>
Curiosity is an emotion. This is Robert Pluchik's Wheel of Emotion that describes eight emotions in the center that are base emotions that can be combined to yield 24 additional emotions. And he orders these emotions that we feel by how often we feel them. Often, sometimes, or seldom. Curiosity is a seldom felt emotion. And just like colors that can be combined on a color wheel, curiosity is made up of two key emotions, and that's trust and surprise. Trust is an important emotion. It's a foundational emotion. It's difficult to achieve because trust implies a level of vulnerability, that I have to trust the information, I have to trust the individual. In fact, if we are inviting curiosity, we can be, our, our curiosity may be, you know, may lead to frustration. Surprise is an important component that follows trust. Surprise means that it's a response to the unexpected. It forces us to stop, reevaluate, and maybe reorient surprise. Now, Pluchik also identifies the opposite of curiosity, and many people think that this might be apathy. Robert Pluchik believes that that's cynicism which is a combination of disgust and anticipation. Whereas curiosity says, I want to learn more, and I want to know more, cynicism says, I already know. I don't need to learn more. And there are many emotions that can be combined sort of along the way as we hopscotch here from delight to disappointment, uh, cynicism, as we mentioned, sadness and joy, as well as a variety of other emotions that are possible along that journey. Although we feel curious only sometimes, there are ways that we can coax it to come forward. And what I found is that it all starts with an invitation. Some object, experience, or notion that we have invites us to be curious. And these invitations adopt a variety of approaches that elicit a spectrum of emotions. But this invitation has to be interesting, and we have to be interested. And as you can see, trust is needed here, or that curiosity will evaporate. Now, as you might be imagining, every invitation requires a response. Most invitations require us to respond in some way. We may not perceive these invitations as invitations, so they can be accepted, rejected, or ignored. Um, and some invitations may function as a wrapped gift that we've never opened. But if we do choose to respond, there's often an inflection point where that necessary emotion of surprise begins to be felt. And that can lead to a reward. There's a golden rule of storytelling that you always want to give the audience what they want, just not how they were expecting it to happen. Now, not every response is rewarded. Kicking over a rock can lead us to a diamond underneath, can simply add dust to our shoes, or it can reveal a danger. But it's up to us to explore. Now, you've interacted with this framework here, and we've come to the part of the day where we're, just, we're going to do something a little silly. You, we're, we'll do it together. What I'd like for you to do is to put your hands to the side of your face like this. Okay, very good. Now, I want you to put your hands in front of your face like this. Very good. Back to the side of your face. One more time to the front, and then back to the side. Very good. Now, if there were a baby sitting in front of you that you were looking at, what did we just do? This is the game of peekaboo. The game of peekaboo is a classic example of this framework where we invite curiosity in the child. The child continues their gaze in our direction, and that curiosity is engaged. They've responded with acceptance to this. And there's a reward on both parties, and this can be done sort of again and again. Um, this is one way that we engage. Um, I've got three more slides, and then uh, Jennifer, we will chat. Uh, I've been begun doing research into the aging brain. And curiosity, as, as I understand it, is absolutely critical to the aging brain. Uh, Andy Rooney. You may remember Andy Rooney once said, the idea of living a long life appeals to everyone, but the idea of getting old appeals to no one. And I think there's a lot of wisdom here. Joe Coughlin from MIT's Aging Lab says that our life is a series 
of 8,000 days. From the time we're born to 21, age 21 is 8,000 days. From 21 to 42 is another 8,000 days. From 42 to 65 roughly is yet another, and from 65 onward is, is another. Now, if you're 65, you've got the same amount of days that you had when you were, you were young. You've got a lot more wisdom at that, at that point in your life. And it's a wonderful way to view this, because you've got just as many days as you had when you were zero to 21, and it's an opportunity for you. So I'd like to end with the worksheets that are on your table. Um, this is a worksheet that you may take home with you and, and interact with. Jennifer, I'm just going to grab one yes, to, uh, to hold up. In this worksheet, you'll notice <clears throat> the first line indicates um, a one-time behavior, the first gray line. The second indi indicates a duration of behavior, and the bottom indicates a path of lasting change. We're going to, today, I'd really just like you to focus on the first thing, trying something new. I know Bonnie Pittman is here this evening, and Bonnie has an activity, I think, for 4,000 days, roughly, yeah. of doing something new every single day. That represents the green dot, doing something new. There is blue behavior of something that you've done in the past that you'd like to try again. There is purple behavior of something that you've done before but you'd like to do more of. And then really important are the gray and the black behavior because these behaviors are often things that prevent us from doing the things on the left, the green, the blue, and the purple. Um, if you'd like to take this home and, and interact with it uh, in multiple times, you may use the sticky notes to write something on them, on the sticky notes, of a behavior that perhaps you'd like to try for the first time and then indicate that in the appropriate area. I encourage you to just focus on the top part because oftentimes you just need a dot. You need a single activity in order to engage before we can begin a span uh, as well. If there's something that you would like to resurrect um, and continue to do as a span of time, you may focus there. But oftentimes this will lead to uh, lasting change. This is based on work by Stanford uh, psychologist B.J. Fogg and a lot of my colleagues in interaction design have used this in the apps that they create to create behaviors that, that engage you as individuals. So this is my takeaway to you. I, I want you to have everyday curiosity. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Cassini. I think um, hopefully everybody has some ideas churning in their minds. Um, I think this was really interesting. I love how you really kind of, you brought it back to brain because a lot of people are at Center for Brain Health. How does this relate to brain? Hopefully we see all this connection, but I specifically wanted to call out a few things. I love how you were talking about um, curiosity related to memory. And then you were talking about aging. And I find it very interesting because in my work, when I've done a lot of assessments and I talk with a lot of people, more people are curious about why their memory is failing. They are curious and it leads to a rumination. And if they're not curious about why I can remember so much ever, they're really worried about, they're curious about why am I losing my memory function and even like the small things. So what, how would you advise somebody to really kind of reframe some of that in a way to be curious about what we still have, especially as you start looking in the aging brain? Yeah. I, I think that's a powerful word that you just used. You used the word reframe. How do we reframe that? If, if I were to say, I have to have lunch with Jennifer, that really sounds like an obligation. If I say, I get to have lunch with Jennifer, that's a simple reframing, that's an opportunity. And in many ways, it's, it's curiosity is, is a reframing of what's another way to look at the situation. Now, sometimes we can borrow from the experiences of others. We can borrow from our friends to say, how might Jennifer look at the situation? How might other friends look at the situation? And that's easy for us to grasp. 
uh, as well. And it's, it's a way for us to explore a perspective other than our own. And it's also a way for us to exercise empathy, which is a form of perspective taking. Um, but I think with, with regards to memory, oftentimes the activities that we engage in when we're curious are brought back to our memories faster than, than those that aren't. And that's why I think activities like the shaping your curiosity activity is important because if we take out the activities that are on the gray and the black that we need to either do less or stop entirely. I won't ask for a show of hands, but watching TV right before, or maybe our phones or interacting with our phones right before we go to bed, right? That's an activity that I would imagine many people in today would probably want to do less of or stop. And then that creates time for us to do the activities that we want. But I think it's connecting to those sort of internal urges and motivations to, to sort of help to improve the memory. I agree. I think if everybody would really focus on the gray and black, I've, I've often, when I've worked with individuals, I always find there's so many people in this world that are yes people and that they want to do everything. And certainly when we're young and hungry in our careers, we say yes to every opportunity. And then as we get older, it becomes more important to our brain health to stop doing certain things yes. and to be able to have some perspective about what it is that we're doing, why are we doing it? Do we still get the same, do we still have the same kind of curiosity about it? So I really, I appreciate that because I think one of the things that we've really learned is the more that we can stop doing some things, it may seem counterintuitive to many of us, but it gives your brain, it frees your brain up for more thinking of really what you want to do. Okay, so I want to ask you, I want to, I want to tie this a little bit very, well, I want to tie this very directly to something that we teach. And so in our training program, in our SMART training program, we teach a strategy, a frontal lobe function called, we call it innovation. And for us, for out of neuroscience, it's really about being flexible in your thinking. Everything you're talking about, we have three different strategies within innovation. And so one of them is, you know, we have these kind of names for them that people can relate to, but one of them is really about perspective taking and is about seeing that there are multiple ways to approach things. Another one's about reframing, particularly about mistakes and seeing how can I do something different. Also, how can I have a, a tolerance, a culture for mistakes so that we can be curious and kind of try? And then lastly is doing things that are just different. And part of that is asking questions. So I really, I love this. I, if everyone would take this home and really do it, this is one of the greatest tools, so thank you. One of the things I wanted to, to talk or kind of tie to is I love this example that you had us do. So this really helped me to reinforce the importance of, and so I want your comments on this. When we think that we are right, and that we are in a disagreement with somebody for whatever reason. And it's like you remember that here, you know, you were doing this and you were right. And then as you brought it down, it was wrong. It was, it was wrong. It wasn't the same direction anymore, right? But it was because it was a different perspective. But it wasn't that you were doing anything wrong. And I just sort of wanted your, kind of your connection. I, I'm seeing that as, how can we use that as a tool to connect to others when we don't necessarily see eye to eye? Yeah, yeah I, think, I think the habit of asking more questions is the challenge. And that's why question tennis as an activity is important to get us to the point where we feel more comfortable. It's, it's less of a friction to, to ask more questions. I, I think it was Jonathan Haidt um, who's at a university in New York, who was describing an activity that he had to do in, in one of his classes. Think of a moment that you had where you were frustrated or angry and write out that moment as, as well as you remember it. Better if it involved somebody else. And he didn't see this coming, which you may very well, which is now think of the other individual involved and write out the same scenario from their perspective. And as he did this activity, he realized that that perspective taking, which again is empathy, is, is oftentimes a way for us to understand that, that both are right, but it's just a matter of perspective. And it allows us to temporarily take on that perspective. 
I think curiosity, one of the challenges that we have with curiosity to bring it into our lives is fear. That's the first blocker that we have to allow it into our lives. That, oh, if I do that, if, if, if I do that, well, then that means that I've got to do this, and I'd rather not. Right? That, that's a fear component that may be um, something that, that prevents it from, from occurring. But when it does happen, oftentimes frustration that, oh, this isn't as easy as I thought, or I don't want to do this, or I'm not enjoying this, whatever it might be. But frustration is often the thing that quelches our, our curiosity. It, it prevents it from continuing. And, and I think the, the opportunity to take multiple perspectives and to ask ourselves, well, what, is, what do things look like from Jennifer's perspective? What do things look like from another's perspective is important. You mentioned earlier that curiosity is linguistically connected to the word care. And to me, that has profound <coughs> implications that curiosity and care are connected. If you can demonstrate genuine curiosity for an individual, you can extend care to that individual. My wife is here this morning. I'm going to embarrass her, but I remember my wife telling me something. We've been married almost 20 years. And she told me one day, you're not as curious as you once were about me. That's hard to hear, and shame on me, quite honestly. But when we first met the individuals that maybe our partners or friends, we had this intense curiosity about them that was really a form of care, that we cared about them, we wanted to demonstrate that we wanted to learn about them. And those questions, we need to find ways to continue to do that, because it, it really is uh, a way that we can extend care to the people around us. And I think that's such a practical and um, incremental way that every single day, if all of us would just ask a different question, get out of our status quo, so the people that we interact with all the time, how could we ask them something different? Engage in conversation just a little bit different, I think is you know, an incremental change. And, and to that point, a couple of questions. What's new? And really, engaging with that individual to say, I'm going to try this out. This funny, crazy guy named Cassini told us to, to give this a go. I'm going to ask you what's new, and let's both try this if, if you're with a partner or a couple. Because if you engage and you actually do this, you can discover things about your partner, your, your spouse, whomever, that you've, you've known for years, decades, that were, were hidden. Um, and it's another way that we can we can re-engage. If you do it in earnest, and both people are trying, that's very, very powerful. Well, I think kind of what you're talking about is the level of effort yes. and fear. Yes. And I think that what we've seen, and you've said this I've, you know, in some of the things that you've talked about in public and, um, and written too, that adults essentially lose, we've, we've lost our sense of curiosity. Hopefully everyone here and everyone's turned in does not, has not done that because that's why you're here. But I think, I think it's this interesting concept that we focus a lot on creativity, on curiosity, on exploration in children, but we don't do it in adults proactively. I don't have anyone, well, I sort of do, have people probing me and prompting me. Depending on your work environment, probably, somebody's always poking you to think differently, if you're lucky. Um, but it, it is making me think a lot about, you were talking about trust, and you know, this idea of do I, have, do I trust the information? It made me think, as an adult, do I trust myself? And I think that that maybe is part of where that fear comes in, is because I'm, I've lack, I lack the confidence, I haven't done it, it's hard, this is new, I don't know what, this, I don't know what the outcome will be, it's unpredictable, whatever the kind of fear mode is. But it's interesting because I think it ties very closely to some of the work by Ian Robertson, Dr. Ian Robertson, who's one of our partners in confidence. So I, I also, I think this is a tool, but I want you to talk to this. He talks about confidence being a, um, a series of habits that you just do so that if you do one small thing and you see that I can do this and this creates action. And so I'm kind of the analogy, I'm like, confidence equals action, like curiosity equals exploration. That's kind of the way I'm thinking of it. So talk about just how would you, how do you, for, for people that really, even if they fill this out, if they start filling this out, what's the kind of the keep the nudge that we keep pushing them? 
Yeah, I think there's, there's two words that are often associated with curiosity as a behavior if you want to, to continue it forward. Curiosity isn't enough. It doesn't have enough inertia to keep us going. And so in order for us to maybe gain curiosity, we have to have a sense of humility that says, you know, maybe there's more for me to know about that. I think you'd agree that the world's expert in a topic has more to learn about that topic. Makes sense. But there's more for us to learn as well. And I think that humility is a necessary ingredient to enabling curiosity to occur. But again, curiosity is not enough. We can fill this out and sort of satisfy our curiosity without ever taking action as a result. And I think in addition to humility and curiosity, I think the, the third thing is courage or bravery to do something about it. Because oftentimes that level of bravery to say, you know, I'm gonna try something new. Bonnie Pittman is a wonderful example of bravery and courage to, to continue that forward, doing something new every single day. And that is, is a habit that's been built. And I think to your point about confidence, is that if we can establish it in small things, I'm gonna try putting on, this could be as simple as, I'm gonna try putting on my socks differently. I'm gonna try brushing my teeth with a different hand. I'm gonna try, you know, um, combing my hair, if you have hair with maybe a, 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 from with a different hand. There's very simple ways that we can challenge this that allow us to build up to greater curiosity. And while we might say, you know, those are common sense, I think common sense is often not common practice. And that's the, the real challenge is, yes, we know, but we have to put it into practice. Right, I think the whole idea of binary, there's a lot, I'm, I'm a curious person or I'm not. No, you can change that. Absolutely. Okay. I want to talk. I want to ask you about, and then I want to open it up for questions. I have so many questions. So um, one of the things I want to talk about, you were you were talking about cynicism, being the opposite of curiosity. Cynicism is a component of burnout. Mm -hmm. I think we're seeing record levels of burnout in this country, really globally, actually. How can we? What, what do you think are some basic things, you know, one or two things that somebody who feels like they're burned out, what could they do in terms, how could they use curiosity to start yeah. getting un, becoming uncynical? Yeah, you know, this is a great question because when we feel that sense of burnout, curiosity may not be the first thing that we need to go to. Um, in other slides, what I will often do is I will change the background color with each passing slide so that by the time we get to the last slide, I've got a completely different color from what we started with to what we ended with. And the goal there is that slowly in our lives, things have changed in the background that we may not be aware of. And I call attention to this, to the audience, to say that you know, by the time you walk out of here, the world's changed ever so slightly. We just might not notice it. With burnout, it becomes very difficult and there's, um, there's various different levels of burnout where one needs to take care of oneself. The reason why I brought up the, the changing background is that it requires us to reflect. And that, I think, is something that we, we don't necessarily do enough of. We're often maybe action-oriented to say, what can I do to take care of this? But reflecting to say, what are the things that I might need right now? Or reaching out. As, as well, I think that's a challenging thing. Curiosity in that moment, we may need to borrow the curiosity of another to say, well, maybe, maybe you need to try this, that, or the other. And that could be through therapy, that could be through friends, but I think in those moments, burnout can be extremely challenging, but curiosity, again, borrowing or lending one's curiosity, I think is a powerful way to, to sort of navigate through that space. Awesome, thank you, Cassini. Yes. Okay, so Steve. Awesome, and I, I always get the chance to ask the first question uh, since I'm holding the mic, but just a couple of comments first. First, to the virtual audience, you will get a digital version of this worksheet, so that will come to you, so thank you for registering, we'll make that available. Secondarily, who would have ever thought that Ted Lasso would, <laughs> would resonate with what you just said, right? Don't be judgmental, be curious. Yes. If you think of the dart when he's throwing darts and people don't know that he's gonna. So it's really, it's really fascinating. And my other takeaway from my prior life is the word delight. Mm -hmm. We know from our brain health, it's so important to ignite delight in your brain. Yes. So I just, that's my big takeaway for me. So 
Anonymous, who I will call Bob from Wichita, asked, does our polarized society tell us that on the whole, we've lost the capacity to be curious in favor of wanting to be right? What would you say that's about a, that? That's a very good question. I, I, I don't think we've lost the capacity. I think we've lost the exercise of that capacity. That, that capacity is always there. Our capacity to be curious is, is always there. It, there may be greater roadblocks in order to overcome the friction that's needed in order to, to, to do that. But I think our capacity to be curious is there. And I think this is where having individuals that we can be curious with, who we can sort of see the world through their eyes and help us to ask more questions. I have a good friend in the audience, Mike Courtney, who helps me to be more curious. His wife, Quinn, helps me to be more curious about the world. And I think having those people around us who encourage us to see from multiple perspectives, yeah, I, don't, I don't know that it's a matter of the capacity to win the link. All right, audience, or we'll go, anyone in our live audience think of questions? Here we go right up front. How do you foster the, the courage, the humility you s were speaking about earlier to ask questions to the, our younger you know, children and kids? Because we grow up telling them to stop asking questions and stop asking why, and this is how life is. So, so how do you reframe that to say curiosity is actually a good thing and not a bad thing? So I'm gonna do what, I'm gonna model the behavior maybe that we might ask our children. Why do you ask me that? Right? And I think asking them to huh. respond and helping them to explore is modeling the behavior. Right? If, if they ask you, you know, the, the sort of patent question is, why is the sky blue or what, what have you, asking them questions is one way that we can, responding with the question that is, is one way that we can help them to also explore and learn more about them. Why do you ask that? What other things are you curious about as, as a child? What, what do you want to know? What, what do you want to do with that information? What can we explore together? What can we do that might elevate your interest in that? In that? I, I think helping them to ask questions begins with us, asking them questions as well. Um, as a child, my, my father would always buy art books for me. And you know, as, as a very young child, these were very large books that were just full of pictures. And I remember asking him questions about that, for which he would always tell me, it's probably in that book. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, don't, don't just look at the pictures, read through it. And at some point, I listened to my dad. But, you know, I, I think in one part it's pointing the way, but it's also modeling the behavior of asking questions. And that can be challenging, but... Um, well, I want to just add to that. I think in the workplace it's interesting when people constantly ask somebody, they always go to you and ask you, what do I do for this? What do I do for this? It, it, if we can become, I love that, if you can become very habitual and just asking your kids back, when they ask you a question instead of being the answer person and you ask them back, well, what do you think? Or what, you know, why do you want to know that? Or what other things do you care about? It helps, I think, to build a more confident, let's, I'll just call it a manager, a supervisor, or just the kind of answerer in, in, in an environment so that you push it back on other people you, and they say, what should we do on this? Well, what do you think we should do? And this helps to foster strength in frontal networks. They are actually, people are thinking. And when we are constantly answering questions for everybody, we are acting as their frontal networks. And our frontal networks are our CEO of our brain that mediate and are responsible for decision making, problem solving, reasoning, being able to think through things. And so if we're constantly being the answerers, so I, I actually love question tennis, because it, you just ask it back or ask some question back, it does promote frontal network development in everyone else around you and that, that person that you're pushing back to. So that's kind of cool. Great question. Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm just curious. I, I don't know if you will have necessarily an answer for this, but something that I'm thinking about. So how do you phrase it? Um, what activities, based on your experience, will give you the, more, the most output in creativity? So like if I do activity A, I will get 100% creativity points. If I do C, I'll only get 40%. I don't even know if that's the right thing to ask, but I'm just curious. And the follow-up to that is, I noticed that you did a lot of examples in which uh, 
in, of, of creativity which involve various people and you have like one that you can do it yourself. Uh, do you think it's better to do it? These exercises with, uh, sorry, the exercises in which you do it with more people, is that better than to do it by yourself? So let me start with the second question and then maybe we can chat about the first question together. If you think about the story of Pandora, Pandora is oftentimes when we talk about curiosity, it's a story that's brought up that explains one aspect of curiosity, which is not, it's not just an individual phenomenon. It's a phenomenon that's a social phenomenon. When you're curious about something, oftentimes the effects of your curiosity don't just affect you. Or if you're affected by what you're interested in, you may tell somebody else, or you might seek out the advice of somebody else uh, as well. So curiosity, why I focus on the social aspects of curiosity is that it, 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 if we're engaging with others, it's also a way for us to explore the perspectives of others. It's also a way for us to, I, I use the term borrow and lend curiosity intentionally because sometimes we have to rely on the curiosity of others. If, oh, I hadn't thought about that question. That's a wonderful question. And when we open up that, that aperture, we start to see and we start to see through it as our eyes sort of adjust, that's an important sort of mental process. The first question, I, I think, uh, you know, I'm curious what, what you think about uh, the, the first question. And the question is really, what can I do to maximize my performance, right, kind of thing? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I don't, I mean, what would you say? Oh. <laughs> Touche. What, what do you think I would say? <laughs> Point for Jen. <laughs> Maybe borrowing from design. Um, in design, we talk about iteration. And we talk about, you want to make mistakes where it's sort of low cost to make those mistakes. Meaning, if we're, gonna, if we're going to explore and innovate, you, you generally have a high failure rate in innovation because it's necessary in order to find the valuable thing. But we often don't do that in our lives. We don't think of our life as iterating. You know, let me try that five times rather than once. Right. Because maybe the first time that I tried it is uh, I'm just learning. And maybe the second time that I try it, I can apply new things. And I think the, the taking an iterative approach to this, that I'm not just gonna do it once, I'm gonna do it three times. Um, and I, th I think that's a powerful way in design that we, we build that muscle of designers that you know, design that logo, no joke, a hundred different ways in, in our classes so that we can see what are the possibility spaces. Mm -hmm. And designers regularly sort of work that muscle. And I think if we can bring that into our lives that, you know, I'm just gonna try this, but it's not gonna be the last time that I try this, which in many cases reduces the risk threshold that we have on that activity or the, our expectations of what we might get out of that. That's a powerful way that we can like, again, lower that risk burden that we may face. Yeah, and I was just going to say, I know Bonnie's got a question, but the, um, what I was going to say was I, I think it's less about a th specific thing to do, but more of the kind of proactive, strategic mindset that you know that your first idea is your worst idea, if that's kind of an operational thing, even if you end up coming back to your first idea. But an, I, a mindset of I'm going to proactively and purposefully solve for m multiple kinds of solutions, but also I do have a tolerance of failure because I know that failing does not mean that I failed. It's actually success, yes. right? Maybe just really quickly before that, that question, I think we, we often have an efficiency mindset. And curiosity is not an efficiency mindset. It's, it's the opposite to it. And true innovation, if, if that's a goal in our businesses, in our lives, or, or sort of deeper meaning, often may not come about from an efficiency mindset. So it's, it's building out those abundant margins of time to allow this to, to occur. Just a thought. Um, I wanted to thank you, Cassini, for thank this, because of course it reminds me of the work that I do about doing something new each day. And to, uh, if I could respond to your question, at night when I'm going to bed, instead of thinking about all the things I have to do tomorrow, uh, when I go to bed at night, I think about what am I gonna do tomorrow that I've never done before? 
And so it completely reframes the way in which I go to sleep. And in the morning, uh, I'm always grateful if I have an answer uh, as a result of sleeping, <laughs> but I'm even more grateful when I can, can come across it. So spontaneity uh, is a great part of curiosity, the accidental, the ability to um, fail. Um, and there's a lot, a lot of do something new is about not everything something new is something good. And that's a really important aspect about curiosity. You have to fail to begin to understand what success is going to be. Yeah. So the question I have is, what is the role of sensory learning, which I use a lot of in Do Something New, in your curiosity model? You know, I, I try to include sensory learning in the activities. We, we did it sort of with the, 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 those activities. And, the, and there's, in the design space, um, there was an individual who taught us about color, and his name was Joseph Albers. And he would have three pots of water, one cold, one hot, and one lukewarm. And he would have students put one hand in the cold, one hand in the hot, and then take it out and put it into the lukewarm. And what would happen is that the cold hand would invert to feel hot. The hot hand would invert to feel cold. And you learn nothing about color specifically, except for the nature of color, is that it's, it's relative. And I think sensory experiences are incredible power, incredibly powerful learning tools. Albers' students talk about that experience of putting their hands in, in the water. Because again, they learn nothing specifically about, well, what's the wavelength of that color, the facts. But bodily, we gain a tacit understanding of these things. And that is, is incredibly difficult to achieve. As a designer, that's my goal, is to try to make it felt rather than just learned uh, in, in the head. But I think that I, I constantly have to remind myself of that, because academia, in many ways, pushes us to focus on the, the brain, not necessarily the, the body as well. What do you think, Bonnie? I have to ask a question. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. <laughs> well, I, of course, I think it's critically important, especially when things, oh, I'm sorry. I, I think sensory experiences are really important, especially when accidents happen and this morning for me was a really good example of uh, making coffee, but the coffee fell off. I was opening a box at the same time, and so the box knocked the coffee off. The coffee spilled all over my legs and the floor and the cats, and I mean, it was a complete mess. And I could have gotten upset, and, uh, and I was burnt by the hot coffee. You know, I mean, it was not a good scene in any regard. But the thing that I focused on was, oh my gosh, look at all the different textures that I have here. You know, I can't believe this. And as I'm cleaning up with the paper towels and newspapers and everything else I turned, I suddenly became excited about absorbency. And so that became the focus of the morning. And the cats were the most absorbent. My white cat, my white cat with brown paws. So I think that's a good example of where Things happen, and I could have been depressed and unhappy, but I turned it around into a sensory yeah. overload experience, and then I had to really clean it up. But sensory experiences, it's a matter of perception, you know, and I think that that's the thing that you, when you go into good or bad things, heighten your senses and try to use ones that you weren't intentionally thinking that you would experience yes. with. Yes. Hey, Jen, can you share with the audience, you know, we talk about sparking creativity in your frontal networks. What really is going on in your brain when you spark curiosity? And does it make sense really that you can be more creative when you let your brain relax? What's happening and what, what's involved there? Yeah, so it's cool because we have, you know, your brain's one big network and there's multiple networks within this brain. And most of the time when we're awake, we're thinking we're using our central executive network because we're listening, we're planning, we're reading through something, we're kind of engaged. But you have another network that's really important and it's called the default mode network. And it's not online when the central executive network is online. And the default mode network is responsible. It's on, for any of you that always say, my brain just won't stop. It won't, I can't turn off my brain. You don't want to turn off your brain, but also that's your default mode network in action. And the default mode network is kind of the popper of our ideas. It's our innovator, it's our entrepreneurial mind. 
And so in order to allow it to do its job and to function the way it is designed, we can't be constantly engaged in thinking all the time, every day. So it is really, it's important, just like with our physical body, to take breaks between exercise and things like that. We take rest days or same thing with the brain, is we need to have downtime. And one of the big things that we talk about is brain breaks. And a brain break is three to five minutes of a disconnect from people and technology. And I think it's, it's interesting because when I've, I'm thinking about what you've been talking about, Cassini, it is isn't a time when if I'm not engaged with anybody, I've, you know, I've intentionally disconnected, I have so many different ideas popping, but then I also have a kind of a bandwidth to be curious about things that are getting under my skin. And I don't intentionally think about these things. They just kind of pop up because they've been on my mind. And so I think it's really important. We all have this ability to leverage these ideas, but you sort of have to get out of your brain's way and let it do its job. And one of those things is having this downtime. And it's quite interesting. People have talked about Im improved sleep, better staying asleep and falling asleep, but also just being able to synthesize these ideas, these experiences, better encoding for memory. And, it, and it's just, it's a way that we can really capture. I think we all have incredible ideas, but we rarely hear them because we are constantly engaged in trying to solve for something or trying to you know, plan and think so hard. I'm gonna ask a question if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't type it in. But what strategies? Have, have worked for you on how to, because I, I think we all experience that of, you know, at, at some points we just can't turn it off. What strategies have worked for you, Jen? So number one, I take brain breaks. I take three to five minute brain breaks multiple times a day. So I drive without the radio on. Mm. I, between big tasks and between meetings especially, I, I don't fill up my time when my meeting ends early. I just I go to the restroom by myself. I mean, I always go by myself, but you know, I go without my phone. That's or a breakthrough I, <laughs> right there, by the way. I just, I, I don't always engage in conversation with everybody around me. And that, I think in some environments that can seem antisocial or you don't care, but it's just sort of strategic for me. It just helps me sometimes to downregulate. I also though prioritize based on the things that are taking my cognitive effort. So I have a lot of projects going on, probably a lot of people in here, you have things that you think about that you could just approach it the way you normally do, or you could be curious about it and ask some questions about it and think, how could I do this better? Or how could, why does this really matter? Or who's my audience? Or, and I think there's so many different ways that we can think about the regular kind of our tasks in curious ways that actually energize our brain. And it gets us thinking in a different way because when we just do everything the same way we always did, we wire to the same thing we always did and we're not really leveraging neuroplasticity. So I think curiosity is such an important thing. Also, I just will say this, people do ask, what, what is the kind of the key to longevity? And of course, there isn't just one thing yet, but if people could be curious, always, lifelong curiosity, is probably one of the biggest keys because that definitely drives motivation and it keeps us engaged in learning. And I mean, even Bonnie, like your example is just a perfect example of being curious about so many things that obviously lead to, wow, how absorbent my cat is. You know, I mean, really, when it could have, you're, you're absolutely right, it could have completely knocked your entire day off kilter in so many bad ways. I mean, we all, we all have those days where you start off on the wrong side of the bed. We can change it. I think by being curious about things. Well, let's thank Professor Cassini and Jen. Thank you. And Cassini, I'm stealing the clock thing, just so you know. I'm going <laughs> to steal that. If you stole it from me, you stole it twice. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, it's really, some of this sounds a little squishy. And six years ago, before I came here, I'd kind of go, okay. This all sounds good, but can you really apply it and does it make a difference? I'm a living example that your brain does stay plastic. You can develop curiosity with habits. I'm the chief uh, operating officer here. I'm an ex-lawyer, I'm a recovering JD, and I'm a recovering CPA. You can make this part of your every day. And I would flip it on you and I would say, I think taking time to be curious actually makes you more efficient. 
uh, because brute force innovation does not work. I did it for 37 years and it's taxing and it's not efficient. So thank you very much. Thanks, every Marlene, thank you very much for sponsoring tonight. We thank you very, very much. Thank you to the virtual audience. Thank all of you and we'll see you at our next show. Thank you.